Hello, everyone. Welcome uh, to our next study in our series of studying the major messages from the minor prophets. I am recording this from home this time. And so uh, whenever you are joining us, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. I uh, hope that you um, uh, have some edification from this study. Uh, let's pray and then we will get started. Dear Lord, we ask that you be present to us as we study your word tonight. Most importantly, that your Holy Spirit would be present as we open your word ourselves to read and hear your holy word, that you would open our hearts and speak into them so that we might be transformed by your spirit into the disciples you need us and want us to be. We make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, well, okay, so uh, like we said, major messages of the minor prophets, and um, we have looked so far at uh, the book of Hosea, and the major message from the book of Hosea is that God's love and faithfulness is often one-sided. It's uh, from God to us much more often than it is us to God. Uh, we are unloving and unfaithful, but God is always loving and always faithful. Uh, and you'll remember Hosea, uh, his life was sort of a performance art in terms of uh, how he was prophesying for the Lord. Uh, he gave his children the funny names. Uh, his wife cheated on him, uh, but he forgave her um, and welcomed her back. And that was a metaphor for God's relationship with Israel. Uh, then the major message from Joel uh, last week is that God desires our repentance, not our destruction. God doesn't want us wiped out. God wants us won over. Uh, God doesn't want to destroy us. Uh, God wants to reclaim us and restore us and um, have a relationship with us. And um, this is why God gives many, many, many warnings um, when uh, we are unfaithful because he wants us to, uh, to have plenty of opportunities to repent. Nevertheless, we will be judged uh, by a loving God, but also by a just and righteous God. And we cannot uh, expect God's justice to apply to everyone except us. And so Joel was a call to look in the mirror and ask ourselves, are we being faithful? What do we need to repent of? If you were uncomfortable with that message uh, of looking in the mirror, then go ahead and stop this now, because Amos is who we are about tonight, and Amos uh, absolutely calls us to look in the mirror and um, be honest about who we are, who we have been, uh, who we are being, um, and it can be uncomfortable to do that. Um, Amos is probably the boldest of the 12 minor prophets. Um, and to, today we're going to read some of his words, which are some of the boldest words uh, in scripture, especially once you understand uh, the context. Again, uh, our hope is that <laughs> you are uh, doing this study and then um, that you are going through the um, uh, questions after having read the book. So I like if you're doing the extra credit version of the class, you read the book, then we come and do the study, and then you read the book again and do the questions. But uh, at the very least, you, you don't have to read it before you come. The idea is that here we're going to give you an overview and an introduction to uh, whatever prophet we are studying. And, and sometimes there will, we'll be doing two in one shot because some of them are very short. Um, anyway, that's not the case with the first three. These all have their own. And um, uh, the idea is that you do the class review, find out what the theme is, then you go and read it. Um, and, and all of these books you can read in one sitting. It's not, they're not difficult. Uh, and then after you do that, you go through the questions for further reflection. If you uh, 
join us by going to the website where we post these on Thursdays, um, then the reflection questions are right there. If, however, uh, you are, join us because you have subscribed to us and you get a notification that a new posting has gone up and you come to us straight through the, um, through the uh, YouTube portal, uh, then the questions are not there on YouTube. So let me show you uh, where those are. Um, just so you know, um, you go to our website, which is right there, secondprez.org. Um, and then Bible study is right here in the middle. And you click on Bible study and here you will find all the videos posted. Uh, and then under each video, questions for further reflection. And if you click on that, this is last week's, this is Joel. Um, in a new window, will open up the questions, uh, study questions for that week. So that's how you do that. Also, while you're there, if you want to scroll down, you can see uh, other studies that we've done. This is what we did in the fall. This is our summer study on racism that we did last year. Here's Bible 101, um, which we did last spring. So uh, all that is there for you. Okay, so Amos. Uh, Amos is a young prophet, and we find out uh, everything we need to know about him uh, in the very first book, uh, first verse, first chapter of the book, um, where it says, these are the words of Amos, one of the shepherds of Tekwa, he perceived these things, meaning everything that follows, concerning Israel two years before the earthquake, in the days of Judah's king Uzziah, and in the days of Israel's king Jeroboam, Joash's son. So uh, the time and date are located very specifically. It's two years before the earthquake. Uh, we know who the king is in Judah and who the king is in Israel. We'll talk more about uh, that split in a minute. And we are told that Amos is one of the shepherds of uh, Tekoa. Uh, that means that he's a farmer, um, shepherd, work, worked outdoors, work in the field. Um, and everything that goes along with being a farmer. Tekoa is a village that's about six miles south of Bethlehem, uh, right on the Dead Sea. So Amos, we find out right away, is not a professional prophet. He wasn't a priest. We've talked about how there was always a place for the prophets in the courts of the kings of Israel. Um, he is not one of those prophets. We'll, we'll see those prophets, but uh, he wasn't one of those. Um, he's taking care of the sheep and the goats and the fig trees on the farm. What's most interesting is that he lives in the southern kingdom um, of, of Judah. Uh, so the, what we're talking about here is the, uh, the kingdom uh, of Israel was united under Saul. Uh, it remained united under David, his son, and then under Solomon, uh, or sorry, David is not Saul's son. Uh, David was called uh, to be the king. But then uh, Solomon is David's son. And so the, the kingship does pass um, patrilineally um, at that point, uh, from that point forward. And um, uh, Solomon retains the United Kingdom. So it's one unified Israel, north and south, under Saul, David, and Solomon, all 12 tribes. Solomon dies around 925 BC, and his son takes over, and his son's name is uh, Rehoboam. And the 10 northern tribes refuse to submit to his kingship. Uh, they don't think that he should be king. They don't think that he is a legitimate king. And so there is a revolt. And Israel is split at that point into two kingdoms. The northern kingdom retains the name Israel uh, because it has the majority of the tribes. Ten, ten tribes remain in Israel. The southern kingdom uh, takes the name Judah. So from this point forward, uh, there's a divided kingdom until, uh, well, I guess until Rome comes in and occupies the kingdom. But, but still, uh, Judah is the southern kingdom. Israel is the northern kingdom. And they didn't like each other very much. 
uh, kind of like the North and the South in this country <laughs> uh, 150 years or so uh, ago. So what's interesting here is that uh, God calls Amos to speak a very difficult word, as we are going to see, but not in Judah where he lives. He calls Amos to be a prophet in the northern kingdom of Israel. So it's like a, 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 a southerner in the United States going to be a prophet in the north during the time of the Civil War. So he leaves his farm uh, in Judah and goes to the northern kingdom to preach. This is, we see all, we learn all this uh, in, in verse one there. Um, and before we go any further, uh, I, I want to say that um, I, I think my, my personal point of view is that um, all of the minor prophets resonate with today, with what's going on today. I think there are a lot of similarities between what Israel was dealing with in this time period uh, and what we maybe are dealing with as a nation, certainly as Christians. Uh, and, and so I think that a lot, of, a lot of what happens in these books, a lot of the historical context um, are very relevant to us today. I think the prophets speaking have relevant words to speak to us today. And my personal opinion you may disagree after this class and maybe after reading it, but my personal opinion is that none more so than Amos. So as Jesus said, let those who have ears to hear, hear. All right, so the northern kingdom, uh, Israel, uh, at this point uh, is in a period of prosperity. Uh, they are very successful. Judah, not so much. Um, Israel has a lot of wealth, a lot of resources, um, and they are um, uh, doing great. It's actually a, a political and economic prosperity that had been unknown since the time of Solomon. So for 250 years, they had sort of languished, uh, but now the economy's booming, stock market is up, uh, making incredible uh, gains. Uh, they were one of the great nations of the world at that time, there was military security. Their, their military was one of the strongest militaries uh, in the region. They had economic affluence. They were a very affluent country at this time, and that meant they were very self-sufficient. Uh, but it was also a situation where there were a few people who were benefiting from this economic boom, and a lot of people who were not benefiting from this economic boom. The rich were getting much richer. The poor were getting poorer because of the policies uh, that the government had in place that favored the wealthy and the privileged and the few who were um, uh, at the top of the food chain. Um, they were a City on the hill in, in their eyes, um, especially the wealthy. They, they, they thought that they were being shown the Lord's favor, that the Lord was pleased with them. And that's why they experienced prosperity. They tied those two things together. Uh, and they saw themselves as a beacon to the world, a, a nation that all the other nations ought to look up to and, um, and try to be like them. So uh, people in the Northern Kingdom, the ones who were benefiting from this were, were loving life. Uh, they were having this, this prosperity. Uh, and then one day, uh, quite unannounced, um, this southerner, this southern farmer named Amos, uh, walks into Samaria, we are told. And um, Samaria is not just the capital of the northern kingdom at, at this time point in time, but also the center of its wealth and power. So if you think, if Washington, D.C. and New York City were all rolled into one city, that's Samaria. 
at this period in, in Israel's history. And this, this uneducated Southern farmer uh, shows up in the middle of this bustling economic government center and begins to preach. And the theme that we are going to see, actually, I'm going to hold off on the theme. Uh, we're going to come back to the theme after we talk about uh, what he says. Usually we do the theme at the beginning. I'm going, to, I'm going to hold off on that a little bit. Instead, I think what I want to do is look, look at the first chapter of Amos uh, and see what Amos said to these people in Samaria. So this is Amos now, uh, and he is talking to the Israelites in uh, Samaria. And he says, the, the Lord proclaims for three crimes of Damascus and for four. Now, I, I want to stop right there. Um, this is an expression that is used over and over throughout Amos. If you're reading the NRSV, uh, it's going to say for three transgressions of Damascus and for four. I am tonight using the um, Common English Bible translation because uh, I think it's a little easier to understand what Amos is saying with that translation, but the NRSV works fine if that's what you're using. Uh, but this is a phrase, it's, it's, a, it's a phrase in Hebrew uh, that, that's an old expression. Uh, it's kind of like when we say in English, the straw that broke the camel's back. Uh, this is a Hebrew way of saying, the straw that broke the camel's back for the Lord in regards to Damascus is. So don't let that uh, throw you. Uh, now, Damascus is the capital of Syria, uh, and Syria was, I, I know that map is, is kind of small, but if you have it blown up, uh, Syria is one of Israel's enemies to the north. Here's Judah, the southern kingdom, uh, Tekoa is down there, um, and this is Israel, the northern kingdom, and then here's Damascus which is the capital of Syria. So Syria is the enemy to the north. So Amos comes from Judah, down here, to Israel, and he starts talking about these guys, the enemies to the north. And he's saying they have sinned. He's saying that they're, they've done a bad thing, and the Lord isn't happy with them. And he goes on to describe what they've done. So he says, for three crimes of Damascus, and for four, I won't hold back the punishment because they have harvested Gilead with sharp iron tools. In other words, God is going to judge Syria for invading uh, Gilead. Now, uh, depending on how big your map is, uh, that, that may be hard to see. Um, uh, but, but Gilead is, well, it's not on this map. <laughs> Uh, but Gilead is down here in, in Israel, uh, and they have uh, invaded uh, Gilead, which was up here, kind of close to the border. Sorry, right in here, close to the border. And um, they perpetrated unspeakable acts of cruelty upon the Israelites in Gilead. So this is, this is what Amos says. Amos says, look, um, God is upset. I have come from Judah to uh, speak to you a word that the Lord has given me. And that word is this, God is upset with the people of Syria. Uh, they have attacked your city, Gilead, with sharp iron tools. And um, therefore, I'm going to punish them. They are going to experience my wrath. So question, do you think the people of Israel were glad to hear this? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, the Syrians were their enemies, and uh, they had been very cruel to the Israelites. And so what, what Amos is essentially saying is they're going to get what's coming to them. And then as you, when you read this, you will see that the next few verses after this describe the punishment uh, that, that uh, Damascus is going to get. And it's not, and it's not pretty. So... Um, so the people who hear Amos proclaiming this would have, would have thought, oh, well, yeah, well, of course, we agree. This guy is saying what we've been waiting for somebody to say. We, we, are, we are so glad he's here. And then in verse 6, it's the same formula for Gaza. The Lord proclaims 
for three crimes of Gaza and for four, I won't hold back the punishment. In other words, the Lord is fed up with Gaza. And what's the straw that broke the camel's back? Because they rounded up entire communities to hand them over uh, to Edom. So uh, they're slave traders. And uh, they have captured whole towns of people, men, women, and children, and sold them into slavery. And because of that, God's judgment is coming upon them. Uh, and then he describes the terrible judgment, which we won't go into. But uh, I imagine by this point, Amos is attracting uh, quite a crowd. Uh, <laughs> because uh, maybe he started with just a few people when he started preaching, but, but the more he talks, uh, the more people like what he has to say. Because all he does is start talking about uh, Israel's enemies and how God's judgment is going to come to Israel's enemies. They're, they are so glad to hear this. Uh, I imagine they're going, now, finally, here's a prophet we like. Uh, this is a prophet we can get behind. This prophet is not raining down doom and gloom, not calling us to change our ways. He is pointing the finger at all those people out there. We're tired of people like Joel who make us look in the mirror. We like Amos. And he goes on throughout the first chapter to continue to prophesy uh, against Israel's enemies. He says that uh, God's judgment is coming uh, to Phoenicia. Uh, it's coming to the Edomites. It's coming to the Ammonites. It's coming to Moab. These names might not mean anything to you, but uh, from Israel's point of view, this was sort of the axis of evil of 750 BC. Uh, so... Uh, it'd be like someone coming to America and saying, you know, the, the, the Russians are going to get what's coming to them and the China, Chinese are going to get what's coming to them and the North Koreans are going to get what's coming to them. Not unlike some political candidates that we know. And at, at this rally, uh, Amos probably has a lot of people gathered who are, who are cheering him on who cannot wait to see this judgment uh, delivered upon these enemies. And for each of these enemy countries, Amos recounts whatever it is that broke the camel's back, the, whatever it is that's the last straw that pushed God over the edge. And it's things like torture and, and slavery, which we've just seen. Breaking treaties is one of them. Slaughter of innocent people. Killing pregnant women is one of them. And Amos is just on a roll. These people have done this, and these people have done this, and I imagine the people are cheering and are quite glad to hear that the heathen infidels are going to get what's coming to them. And then we make the turn to chapter two. And now Amos uh, surprises the crowd just a little bit. Because now he starts in on Judah, which is the southern kingdom of Israel. And remember, the, they didn't get along, but he's from Judah. So now he's talking about his own country. So now what we hear uh, Amos say, and, and remember, he's saying this about his own country. The Lord proclaims for three crimes of Judah and for four. And I imagine that the people are taken aback when they hear him say Judah. They're, they're not expecting Judah. I won't hold back the punishment because they have rejected the instruction of the Lord and haven't kept his laws. They have been led off the right path by the same lies after which their ancestors walked. I can imagine that at first people were taken aback, but at this point, they are all in on Amos because this is exactly the reason for the division. This is exactly why the country is divided in the first place. The Northern Kingdom accused the Southerners of rejecting the Lord's instruction, of not keeping God's laws, of being just like their ancestors. They saw themselves as faithful. That's why they were uh, prosperous. It must be why they were prosperous, uh, because they were faithful to God. Those Southerners, though, they were not experiencing prosperity because they were not faithful. So, They've been waiting for someone to come along and speak the obvious truth that Judah no longer obeys God's commandments. So 
all the better that it's someone from there who says this. He knows. He's seen it. He's lived it. And so now they're like, bold move, Amos. Way to go. Way to go. They're applauding. They're cheering. Amos has them in a frenzy. They maybe are shouting, you the man, or one of these things. And then, and, and, and maybe you are familiar with the book of Amos. Maybe you know what happens next. Maybe even if you aren't familiar with Amos, maybe you have some idea of what's going to happen next. But, but Amos's audience doesn't have a clue. Uh, they are thinking that God has sent Amos not only to tell them how angry he is with their enemies and Judah, but now he's going to tell them how happy God is with them. He's, he's trashed the enemies. God's judgment is coming on the enemies. God's judgment is coming on Judah. And they're expecting, but you, my beloved Israel, have been faithful. And so I will bless you to the thousandth generation. I mean, that's what they're expecting. Obviously, God is on their side. I, well, every, everybody thinks God is on their side. Isn't that what Lincoln said in the Civil War? Both sides pray to the same God. Both sides think that God is on their side. That's what they're expecting. As I said, you, you probably get that it's all set up. Uh, and that's not the direction uh, that Amos goes. In fact, he goes in the opposite direction. The Lord proclaims for three crimes of Israel and for four. I won't hold back the punishment. Imagine now there's silence in which you could hear a pin drop. Because, wait a minute, it, it sounds like Amos is talking about us. It sounds like Amos is saying that we're not faithful. And what are the reasons? Because they have sold the innocent for silver and those in need for a pair of sandals. They crush the head of the poor into the dust of the earth, and they push the afflicted out of the way. Father and son have intercourse with the same young woman, degrading my holy name. They stretch out beside every altar on garments taken in loan. In the house of their God, they drink wine, bought with fines they imposed. So it sounds like. Amos is talking about Israel as if they are one of God's enemies, because that's exactly what he's doing. Uh, and if Amos has been recounting the last straw for each nation, the, the one thing that, that sent God over the edge for each nation, uh, what was it for Israel? Well, the last straw for Israel is the way those who have treat those who don't have. Those who have wealth and privilege and resources, how they treat those who don't have wealth and privilege and resources. In, in other words, God's beef with Israel is the way God's people treat the poor. And maybe not is what you, not what you were expecting, certainly wasn't what they were expecting. Uh, and so that's why uh, I, I wanted to hold off um, on the theme, because what we're going to see now is uh, Amos talks about uh, how God's people can demonstrate a right relationship with God, and that is by practicing justice. The problem is they are not practicing justice. They are not treating the poor justly, and not just the poor, as, as we're going to see in a minute. Um, but that's, that's, their, that's their sin. Um, he doesn't say uh, the problem with the nation is that they don't worship enough. Uh, he doesn't say the problem with the nation is that no one goes to church anymore, that they don't read their Bible, that they don't hang the Ten Commandments in the schools and the courtrooms, that people don't pray anymore. The problem is you've taken prayer out of schools. They don't say the problem is, is that people 
stop going to church and they go to Starbucks or Lowe's or Walmart on, on the Sabbath. He doesn't say a whole lot of things that we might expect him to say, uh, things that we hear Christians say today about what's wrong uh, with the world. He says, no, the problem from God's point of view is the way that people who have resources, who claim to know God and who claim to love God, and who claim to follow God, it's how they treat those who have few resources, because they're not treating those people the way God wants them to be treated. And that's the theme that runs throughout Amos. Uh, the people with power are callous and unloving towards the people who don't. Now, why is this the thing? Why does this anger God so deeply? Why is it this and not idolatry? I mean, that's, that's one of the top three of the Ten Commandments. Well, it's because throughout their history, God has told Israel over and over and over again that his number one priority, his chief concern, the thing that he wants them to be concerned with above everything else is how the poor are treated. In fact, in Deuteronomy 24, Moses, speaking for God, tells the people of Israel at the, at their, really at their constitution of being a people, what God expects his community to look like, how God wants things to work. Um, Moses says, this is what God wants your life to look like as a nation, our life to look like as a nation. And, and in Deuteronomy 24, uh, there are three groups of people um, that get mentioned. And this same three groups of people uh, are mentioned over and over and over again, all throughout the Hebrew scriptures, Anytime uh, people are speaking for God or God is speaking to the people about what he wants, this, these three groups of people uh, are mentioned as the groups that Israel is charged with taking care of before anything else. Um, so let's, let's read this back from Deuteronomy. Moses says, don't obstruct the legal rights of an immigrant or an orphan. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure you can see that. There we go. Don't in, obstruct the legal rights of an immigrant or an orphan. Don't take a widow's coat as a pledge for a loan. Remember how you were a slave in Egypt, but how the Lord your God saved you from that. That's why I'm commanding you to do this thing. So th the care of, of, the, uh, of these marginalized groups, these, these, the, the, uh, the, the poor, the immigrant, the orphan, the widow. It comes, it, it is a way to show God that they understand what God did for them. It's a way of showing their gratitude. God says, I saved you when you were in Egypt and you were poor and marginalized and had nothing. I rescued you. Therefore, if you want to be obedient to me, then you need to take care of these groups of people. I did it for you, now you do it for others. That's why I'm commanding you to do this thing. Whenever you're reaping, then he gives some instructions here. Whenever you're reaping the harvest of your field and you leave some grain in the field, don't go back and get it. Let it go to the immigrants, the orphans, and the widows so that the Lord, your God, blesses you in all that you do. In other words, don't maximize your profits. Don't hoard. Leave something. Similarly, when you beat the olives off your olive trees, don't go back over them twice. Don't, don't get every last olive. Let the leftovers go to the immigrants, the orphans, and the widows. Again, when you pick the grapes of your vineyard, don't pick over them twice. Let the leftovers go to the immigrants, the orphans, and the widows. Remember how you were a slave in Egypt. That's why I'm commanding you to do this thing. So this group of three that we see over and over throughout Scripture are, are God's favorites. They are God commands his people, to take care of these people. And it's the immigrants, the orphans, and the widows. The foreigners, the immigrants, he's not talking about tourists here. He's talking about the people who have immigrated to Israel to try to get a piece of their prosperity, who come from other countries that are poor and downtrodden where they don't have a lot of opportunity, and they make their way to Israel, this prosperous nation, in search of a better life. And then there were the orphans, the people who had no fathers, 
people who grew up either in a single mother household or with no parents whatsoever, wards of the system, being raised by their grandparents. They got nobody to look out for them. They're all alone in the world. God says to Israel, you look out for them. And then third of the widows. At that day and time, mostly women whose husbands had died. And at that time, if you were a woman whose husband had died, you didn't, you didn't have a way to make a living because you weren't allowed to work. So if we extrapolate, widows are those without means, those without power, those who are alone, those who are at the bottom of the economic system, those who are burdened with too much weight on their back. God says, take care of the immigrants because they're likely to be mistreated. They're likely to be resented. People are likely to be afraid of them. They're likely to be discriminated against, treated unjustly. It's up to you to treat them justly. Take care of the orphans because they don't have anybody else to watch out for them. They're all alone in this world. They need role models. They need people to teach them how to be a proper human being and take care of the widows because they can't provide for themselves. They need your help. Today, we would call these marginalized people uh, or a phrase that I like, uh, the least, the last, and the lost. Those people who are most likely to be mistreated and overlooked, forgotten, ignored, oppressed, discriminated against, taken advantage of. There are over three dozen verses each about the immigrant, the orphan, and the widow, all calling on God's people to show justice and compassion to these groups of people in obedience to God and out of gratitude for what God has done for them. So the problem that Amos is addressing in Israel is that God's people made no connection between their relationship with God and their treatment of these groups of people, their treatment of the poor. They worshiped really well. They had great worship services, wonderful worship services. They packed the temple. They said all the right things. They sang all the right songs. They made all the right prayers. They made all the right offerings in the offering plate. They did worship well. And they lived under the illusion that because their lives were going well, God must be happy with them. God must be blessing them. God must be pleased with them. Which is why Amos, this unbelievably bold prophet, says this then in chapter five. I hate, this is, he's speaking for the Lord here. I hate, I reject your festivals. I don't enjoy your joyous assemblies. If you bring me your burned offering and gifts of food, I won't be pleased. I won't even look at your offerings of well-fed animals. Take away the noise of your songs. I won't listen to the melody of your harps but let justice roll down like waters, righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Amos said that. Well, the Lord said it through Amos. Not Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Well, he said it. He didn't originate it. I, I visited the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial a few years ago in Washington, D.C., and on the wall behind him, they have all these famous quotes behind the statue and one of them says, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream, Martin Luther King Jr. And I was like, mm, pretty sure he wasn't the first guy to say that. <laughs> this passage is incredibly important because God is saying, I don't care what you think you're doing for me. You're not doing anything for the ones I care about. Therefore, you're not doing anything for me at all. In fact, I hate what you do. Now, the Lord doesn't express hate very often. Here's something interesting, a little trivia. Only five times in all of Scripture does the Lord say that he hates something. It's always directed towards actions, never towards people. 
The Lord doesn't hate people. The Lord hates the actions of some of the people. And every time the Lord expresses hate in the scriptures, it's directed toward the actions of his own people. The Lord never says that he hates what the Philistines are doing, or what the Moabites are doing, or what the Ammonites are doing. It's always what his own people are doing. Things that are against his will, things that disappoint him. And here he says he hates it when his people worship him, but don't seek justice for the poor. He says, I hate your religious assemblies. I hate your festivals. I hate your offerings. I hate the songs you sing. All of it. Because once you leave church, you don't seek justice for the poor. So your worship means nothing to me unless you do that. In fact, that's what your worship is. If you want to worship me, justice for the poor. And then in uh, chapter 7, uh, God gives Amos this unforgettable picture. He shows Amos a plumb plum line. This is what the Lord showed me. The Lord was standing by a wall with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? A plumb line, I said. Then the Lord said, see, I am setting a plumb line in the middle of my people Israel. I will never again forgive them. Now, maybe you know what a plumb line is. Maybe you don't. That's what it is. It's a weight on the end of a string. Gravity pulls it down. The string is straight. It's real easy to understand. Even I can understand a plumb line. A plumb line tells you if something is straight or not. It tells you if something's straight or something's crooked. It's a standard. And that standard is absolute. Either something is true to plumb or it's not. A, a wall is either true to plumb or it's not true to plumb. On the, on the package of the plumb line that I have, the, the plumb bob, which is what hangs at the end of the plumb line, it says, for determining true vertical in construction. Carpenters are not into relativism. <laughs> Carpenters don't say things like, well, you know, we all have our own plum. Y you can have your plum. I can have my plum. Neither one is right. Neither one is wrong. We all have our own plums. If something isn't plum for you, it might be plum for me. Don't push your plum on me. I have my own plum. <laughs> plum doesn't work that way. Either something is plumb or it isn't plumb. And God says, I'm setting a plumb line among my people. I'm going to measure them by this one standard that counts. And it's real simple. Are they taking care of the poor? Are they taking care of the immigrants, the orphan, and the widow? Are they feeding the hungry? Are they ministering to the sick? Are they standing up to the oppressed? For the oppressed. Are they caring for the lonely elderly widows? Are they befriending those who are discriminated against? Are, are my people seeking justice for those for whom justice has been scarce or missing completely? Are my people as outraged as I am when one of the least or the last or the lost is taken advantage of in some way? It's real simple, God says. Either they're doing it or they're not. That's the plum. That's the standard I'm going to measure them by. Brothers and sisters, it is so important that we understand this about the heart of God. God is very clear about this in the scripture. God will judge his people. I want to make sure I've got that. God will judge his people and their society by how they treat the poor and the marginalized how they treat the oppressed and the elderly and the lonely and those people who are just plain old weird, the foreigner and the fatherless and the widow and the young pregnant woman who is unwed, the gay, the transgendered, the eunuch, people who are different sexually, the immigrant at your border. God makes it unmistakably clear that he takes it upon himself to protect these weak ones and the way he does that is by commanding his people to take on that responsibility, to bear that burden. He makes it unmistakably clear that anybody who neglects them neglects him. 
We see that again in Matthew. On the day of judgment, the people who took care of the poor are the people who enter into the Father's glory, and the people who don't, don't. And it bewilders me when I look at this country today, how our immigrants are treated. When I turn on the news and I hear about the caravan, and it's, it's like there's some boogeyman, and when families are separated at the border, and Christians are not standing up in mass outraged at this. When our prisons are packed with young black men who grew up without fathers, with no role model to teach them. It befuddles me that Christians aren't up in arms about this, trying to fix this and do something about it. You know, the things that Christians get so upset about today are not the things that God gets upset about. The things that I hear Christians complaining about and what's wrong with our country, they're not the things that God complains about in the prophets, in his holy word. God says through Amos, look, if you want to show that God matters to you, if you want to show that you, you have a right relationship, a good, strong relationship with God, then you need to do it by practicing justice, especially to the poor, especially to the immigrants, especially to the widows, especially to the orphans, especially to those whose voices are drowned out by the powerful and the prosperous and the politically savvy who are at the top of the heap making the laws to keep everybody else down. Amos is looking at a whole part of society that had resources and that had power who thought they were honoring and worshiping God, but in reality had betrayed God's vision for a just society, a compassionate, loving society, all so that they could have their own personal, financial, and material gain. And Amos cries out to them, look, do you think God was joking when he asked you to take care of these people? Do you think that God doesn't see what's going on in your country right now, that the one who calls himself the defender of the fatherless no longer cares about these people that you ignore every day? Do you really think that you can take all of the resources that come from God's hand, by the way, and just use them to help yourselves get richer and then get mad if God doesn't keep sending you more to satisfy your greed? Is that what you really think? No, Amos says. Get it together, people. If you want to have a good relationship with God, it's how you treat the marginalized and the poor. Now, we all understand something about this because we live in a society that's not much different. Everybody's walking around looking for money, food, pleasure, the bigger house, the larger income. And in our society, the weak are at the mercy of those who hold power. In our society, we have mega churches where people worship by the thousands on the weekends, building larger and larger buildings with gyms and restaurants and cafes, and they do worship really well. They have really excellent programs, but they're not doing anything to speak up for the immigrant, the orphan, the fatherless, the widow, the poor, the marginalized. In fact, by building these big buildings, they have actually insulated themselves from the poor and the marginalized. Very few even have to come into contact with the poor and the marginalized. But they've insulated themselves from the very people God's heart goes out to. We are so focused on getting more people and more worship attenders and more money and more resources so we can have better programs and bigger buildings and a more influential ministry. While all around us, people are starving. People are struggling. People are giving into depression. It's important to remember that the prophets don't want to condemn Israel. Remember Joel. God doesn't want our destruction. He wants our repentance. The prophets want to save Israel, not condemn Israel. So we need to hear Amos's challenge in this context. 
He is saying, you need to take a hard look in the mirror. God wants to restore this relationship. And so God is telling you exactly what you need to do if you want to get back on track. He challenges the Israelites to come back to God. He says, seek God and live. Come back to God. Come back to the heart of God and live. Over and over, he says, seek God and live. Remember what God holds dear. Remember what God holds important. Have the heart of God about you. It's not too late to turn your back on all that you've been doing. It's not too late to embrace the will of God. Like I said, maybe the most relevant prophecy for our world today. A difficult word for us to hear, but a necessary one. Well, enjoy your reading. Open your hearts, open your minds, allow, allow God to truly speak to you. Don't be defensive. I get that way. I get defensive. I read the prophets and I get defensive. I want to say, but that's not me, God. That's everybody else. That's not me, but it's me. It's me. I spend way many more hours each week worrying about doing worship right than I do about taking care of the poor. I put way many more hours in every week, making sure that our worship experience is a good one, whether it's live in person or, or recently virtually. I spend way more hours editing videos than I do caring for the immigrants. You know, I see the news and I go, that's terrible, that's a shame, but I don't, I don't speak up like I should. I don't say that so that you'll go, oh, Pastor Tim, it's okay. Don't be so down. It's, it's not about that. It's about, it's about being obedient, having a right relationship with God. And, and to do that, it means that we're called to do justice. Uh, later on, there'll be another prophet. His name is Micah. And he says, what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, love mercy, walk humbly with the Lord? I think in the in the North American church, we, we do pretty good at loving mercy and, and walking humbly with God. It's the justice thing that seems to be missing most often. So I, I hope you go through the questions that I've written because they will help you sort of process this, read the book, go through the questions. And then one of the questions is what, what can we do to make this world a more just? world, a, a world more like what God wants? What are the specific things that we can do so that our hearts match God's hearts? Heart. <laughs> our wills match God's will and that we are doing everything we can to make sure that justice rolls down like the waters and righteousness like a never flowing stream. That's Amos. And uh, we will see you next week for Obadiah. Have a good week.